Hey, and welcome to the eighth exercise of the reinforcement learning lecture of the Paderborn University. Today we are dealing with the supervised learning topic. The following teaching units are actually also taught in this fashion or similar as this in Udemy, for example, or other learning platforms as EDX, Kaggle, and so on. So the following methods are general purpose. However, we add a twist on engineering applications here. That's why we would like to start off with a data set from Kaggle, which was hosted by our department. Uh, this data set contains measurements from a PMSM, permanent magnet synchronous motor, in our test bench, which was recorded during several hours. And the main purpose of this measurement was to gain insight, scientific insight into elementary vectors and what currents are induced by them at which motor speeds or angles. Why would we need such a data set? If we are able to make an estimator which can estimate currents or elementary vectors from currents precisely, then we would be able to predict the dynamic behavior of the motor better, and this would in the end lead to a better efficiency of the electric motor, of the full drivetrain maybe, even so, such that we can on the long run increase the range of an electric vehicle. More specifically, the dataset consists of following features. We have an n1k, which is the elementary vector, a discrete variable from 1 to 7, at time point k minus 1, whereas the k index stands for the time point at k, and k1 would stand for time point k plus 1. And in those time points we have the following features n for the elementary vector, id for the current in the d coordinate axis, iq for the q coordinate axis, and epsilon for the rotor position or rotor angle. The dq transformation, you can read it up to this link here, is just a coordinate transformation from alpha beta coordinates, which is in itself also transformed from the ABC currents. Um, the main purpose of the DQ transformation is that our current voltages, uh, quantities that are varying with the rotor speed, are in are constant in the DQ coordinates, such that our sign-shaped variables are now also constant, and it's easier to work with them here. Um, if you are interested in this topic also beyond the scope of this exercise, then you can read on on this topic following those two links here. Okay, but let's start with this data set. First of all, we're not using the original data set from Kaggle, as that would be over two gigabyte, and it's not, it's not providing any more insight for the sake of this exercise if we have this big data, data set. That's why I prepared one already. I called it reduced e-motor, and it should be available with this exercise through our Panda platform. If you're loading it with the Pandas library, we can print shape information and short head information with the F point shape and the F point head, where we see that we have loaded uh, roughly 2.5 samples with seven features. And the first five rows are now here printed or enlisted in this table, where you can see that all quantities are floating point numbers except for nk and n1k. The elementary vectors, these are discrete. So we could also treat them as integers or label encoded categories, but more to this later. So reading CSV files is pretty easy. It's actually even easier to work with CSV files through Python and Pandas if the data set grows large in size, even beyond sizes of several gigabyte, or as much as fits into RAM, in contrast to other tools or software like Microsoft Excel. So this is a big advantage of using Python for data analytics. So if we would like to if we would like to wrangle a little bit with this data, then we could of course add more information into this table. A data frame is essentially a table. So we could use either of two syntax. First of all, the assign method, 
which would always return another data frame with the with the enhanced features with the further features here we are assigning it to df or we could use dictionary style here by by assigning directly into a column name a new feature in this cell we have to a very toy example where we are just connecting the information of n1k and nk together as a transition so that arrow string here is just uh, emphasizing a transition from one elementary vector to the other if we have added this feature we can see we can print the columns of the data frame and see that it is now contained in our data frame as well and we can now work with that we can print the value counts that means the number of occurrences of each single unique value in pairs we can sort and if we print the first 10 occurrences we can see that each transition appears or occurs uh, exactly 50,000 times this is not random this is intentional because this is the way i prepared this small data set from the original data if you're going to work with the original Kaggle data set then you will see that there are major differences in the occurrences of occurrences of those transitions here so let's go on with the exploratory data analysis this is usually done before you do any any feature engineering or sophisticated modeling in order to understand the data better this exploratory data analysis or eda uh, encompasses usually distribution visualizations missing data detection this is really important in this case in this exercise on this data set there are no missing data that's why we are omitting this but elsewise this is actually something you would do before you would do anything else of course also the substitution of, of such or even uh, removal of those then the linear correlation analysis where we try to see whether we have strong linear correlations that would be an indicator to work with simpler models with simple linear models which should be preferred over more complicated non-linear models in case it is appropriate if our data is a time series then there could be we could do even more analysis on time series data see the timely dependence between neighboring samples and so on and so forth so forth so there's much that that can be done you would see a lot of examples of edas on kaggle if you just visit that website here we're taking a small glimpse on what is possible and try to infer some insights from the eda before we go over with feature engineering we start off with distribution visualizations in this case histograms of the categorical variables first the elementary vector at time point k and time point k minus one are shown here on the left and right and we see here nothing particularly interesting they're just scattered equally 350,000 times for each elementary vector this is due to the sampling of the original data set uh, for this reduced version the original data set wouldn't be as homogeneous as we see it here but okay good to know then we would have histograms of the floating point variables here which are the currents and epsilon so the currents at time point k here on the left and at time point k plus one on the right they are a little bit different but the general shape is uh, almost the same we see that id is only negative we see that iq is only positive and if we recall that the dq transformation means that d and q currents are perpendicular to each other then we can imagine to we can imagine them to describe a quarter of a semisphere so to say the the upper left quadrant or the second quadrant in mathematical notation is described by those currents so we are only moving around in this area and we can also see that uh, currents between 0 and 100 ampere in amplitude are more are more likely than higher currents with very few currents at the maximum of minus 250 ampere of id and plus one 250 ampere for 
IQ. The same goes for ID at k plus 1 and IQ at k plus 1. There are some higher currents. There are, there are some higher currents appearing up to 300. But besides that, nothing, uh, nothing very different from the other currents here. From epsilon k, we can see that for n k equal 1, there is a, a uniform distribution, almost uniform. But for the other case, for the other elementary vectors, you can see that the shape is roughly like a sine shape, which is which has its background in the physical control of the motor, where at certain elementary vectors, uh, th that certain elementary vectors are actually preferred at certain epsilons during during uh, operation. That's why we have this sine shaped distribution here. So having seen how distributions are plotted, you are tasked with the first exercise, which is to add the sine and cosine of the rotor angle to the data frame and the Caron vector norm of both time steps, plus plotting their distributions in the same manner as we have done here. And in, for the solution, I use the assign method. So I declared the new feature names, sin epsk, k, for example, co cosinus cos epsk, k, i norm k, i norm k1, and e I equaled them to the uh, corresponding mathematical transformation. I use NumPy for that. So in here, this is the inline function style in order to determine how the new feature looks like, but you could have also omitted this part, lambda df, and just directly write the, the transformation into, into this keyword here. Would be also perfectly fine. You could also do it with this inline function, which is of uh, some benefit if you are defining your features in a dictionary, for example, for later use or for later assigning. But in this case, it doesn't really matter. So if we print the first five entries with dot head, we can see that the new features are also appearing now in our data frame, so everything went right. And if we plot the distribution of those new features with the function that was determined, declared uh, earlier, we can see also the histograms of the new features. And this is also nothing really um, mysterious or unexplainable. We've seen the sine and cosine of epsilon. It has peaks at plus one and minus one, which is in principle correct. And we see for the norm that it perfectly explains also the distributions of ID and IQK. If we would take the square of each value and sum them up together, take the square root. So we have our peaks at around 190 ampere or 200 here for time point k and the same for time point k plus one now if we go over to plot scatters or make scatter plots of our features this is also always very interesting to do here i did it uh, I, by an unfolding over the elementary vectors every time you have categorical variables you could you could make plots unfolded over those categorical values as long as the cardinality is not too high so in this case the cardinality is 7 for the elementary vectors this is still doable here but if it goes up to 100 200 then it's difficult to show in in this fashion nonetheless here it's possible and we can see we are plotting the scatter of the D current in blue and the Q current in yellow. And we do it by having on the X axis IK in ampere and on the Y axis I at time point K plus one. So IK one. And we see that there are strong linear correlations. That means it's most of the time a pretty diagonal for for nk equal 1, it is even a tighter diagonal. For the other 
elementary vectors, it, it, has, it exhibits a bit more scatter. Nonetheless, we can see directly by bare eye that there are strong linear correlations between the currents in neighboring time points. So samples that are neighbors in the time series are, are very strongly dependent on each other. Which is good to know. That means that uh, linear models might be of, of great use here already. But we will see that we will see that in detail in the next cells. Um, one insight we can draw already here is that if we would only use IK as a feature for um, predicting IK1, just one feature model, for example, a linear model that would translate to putting a straight line somehow into this graph in order to describe all the points here in the scatter. We see that the scatter in, in the worst case is, is covering almost around 200 ampere. So putting a straight line into the middle here, we would, we would still have errors around plus minus 100 ampere worst case. So with a linear, linear model, even though it is pretty diagonal, with a linear model, we would still have high errors up to 100 ampere. We can say that already from here, in case we would use only IK as a feature and no more. But first, let's see how strong the linear correlation is also for other features by a, by a linear correlation heat map. The linear correlation is calculated by the Pearson correlation coefficient, which is just the covariance between two features divided by their both standard deviation. It, this translates to one single number, floating point number, which varies from plus one to minus one, whereas plus one means a perfect positive correlation and minus one a perfect negative correlation, and zero would be no correlation at all. So in this plot, we see all, all feature interactions, um, more particular the linear correlation between those features. So we see a particularly negative linear correlation between IDK1 and the norm at K1. Same for IDK1 and I norm K. And a particularly high linear correlation between IQK1 and the norm K, which is just in fact because of the way we we transformed IQ and I, IK, IQ and ID to the I norm. So this is nothing which is surprising. And which is more interesting, we have very, very high linear correlations here in yellow for IQK to IQK1 and IDK to IDK1. Same for I norm K to I norm K1. So that means that currents at any point in time are very good predictors or li linear correlators for uh, the same value in the next time step. So this value can, can't vary a lot from one time step to the next, which uh, translates to a non-stationary process. So neighboring samples are not really independent from each other. They are strongly dependent. Which, yeah, which helps us maybe to, to predict next time steps of the current more easily with what we have at each point in time. There is a bonus task here asking to reconstruct complete time series from the data set. This will be particularly interesting because we see that the, that the quantities, the currents, uh, are strongly dependent on each other from one time step to the next. So if we would have more history at each point in time than just one, one sample from the last time step, then we, we might have even better predictors for the upcoming currents, so better regressors for our prediction task later. But here, without, without doing this reconstruction, we are, yeah, we, are, we are set with only the feature, the currents at each point in time. And we need to predict as precisely as we can only with that. So this, this concludes our EDA already. Of course, you could do a lot more to analyze. You are also invited to do. 
a bit more graphical visualizations, a bit more analysis. But for the scope of this exercise, this should be it. So we go over to modeling now and feature engineering. We use a very standard cross validation technique, uh, the same that was introduced in the lecture, which is uh, five folds CV, uh, where we split the training set into five folds and then repeat training five times with different testing folds. Uh, important here for the sake of this exercise, we are not splitting the data into training and test set because we're not going to conduct any uh, hyperparameter tuning. So it would it will be sufficient to just go with the uh, training with the training set describing the full data set and then reporting the errors during the folds. That would be a sufficient report now for now. Um, explaining the generalization ability of the model at that current uh, hyperparameter set that we're going to give those models. But later, if we would like, if we would like to tweak, for example, the hyperparameters of our models later, then it would be necessary to do a pre-split in, in beforehand of the data into training and test set. All right, we start off with regression, linear regression. So this was also given with a lot of feature engineering. This is this is the way how you would engineer new features, which is mm, partly informed by our EDA in so far that we, for example, take the minus of IQ for some transformations for the exponential here, for example, or the absolute values for the exponential because we have seen that they are only negative, for example. Um, but most of the time there are basic operations like taking the sum of two values or taking the square of a, of a value. So this is standard procedure and it's not really um, hand, hand designed uh, particularly for this data set so far. We also have four features which are aggregated over the full data set. And yeah, I was asking here in a comment whether this might be, is this okay to do it like this? And the the answer to this is actually no, this is not okay, because we are going to get two optimistic predictions then, since those features here are now going to contain some sort of information from our test set later in our in our cross validation. So this would be also called data leakage or test set leakage, where some information of the distribution we would like to predict is leaking into our training set. So our performance will look good in the cross validation, but then predicting really new independent, independent observations won't be as good as they were here. So the, the actual way we would use those features is by uh, not aggregating them here up front before CV but but creating those features in the training loop here after we have done the split into training and uh, test set here at this at this point in, in the loop there would be the appropriate point to do uh, feature aggregations over the training set. All right, but for the sake of simplicity, we did it here up front already. And we see that we have very high, very high mean squared errors of over 4,000, which is, which is pretty large. And yeah, the, the explanation why, or what did, what went wrong, maybe, should be also pretty easy. We had that in the lecture as well. Uh, we missed something to do here, and the task, the second task was to rectify this. So now in the solution, we see that two things were missing. First of all, one hot, one hot encoding of the categoricals. We missed to, we missed to encode our categoricals into binary features. Um, because since the categoricals before went as a discrete variable from z from zero to seven into into the modeling 
our linear model would try to infer any any reason or any pattern between uh, higher numbers and lower numbers for example for the elementary vector it, it would look out for any correlations for an increasing nk for example and the currents but we know up front is that this is not reasonable there's no physical there is no physical um, background for the order of elementary vectors not really so we should we should separate that into into seven binary features in order to help the linear model to not try to to find any patterns in there in the ordering so we do that here for the elementary vectors uh, we drop then the original features because yeah we, they were transformed already pairs we, we omit that completely we could also have feature engineered or one hot encoded the pairs feature but that would translate to 49 binary features which is going to make our full data frame a lot a lot bigger and a lot more sparse uh, we we don't do it here but of course you could also try that maybe that would be of some help moreover the second thing we missed in the template was to scale the data so here we are scaling our training and test set with a min max scaler which comes from scikit-learn uh, sk learn preprocessing this is the module where we are importing that we could also use the standard scaler which is just subtracting the mean and then dividing by the standard deviation such that the standard deviation of each feature equals to one but in this case we take the min max scalar which is transforming the features into a range of zero to one both is perfectly fine very important you should not do the scaling up front because then again you are introducing some information from each test set into each training set so here we do it correctly we scale in the training loop where we are instantiating a new scalar for, for x and y we have two different scalars because we are transforming the prediction later back with inverse transform here at this place that's why we need two scalars and um, yeah you see here the the syntax we, we take each from each train set and test set we take the x columns and y columns and then transform them transform them separately um, we train our linear regression here now then on the transformed x and the transformed y we predict the transformed test set on the x columns and this prediction we are then uh, reverse transforming or inverse transforming with inverse transform such that our prediction is again in the same magnitude in the same scale than our y test so and then we see that the metric looks a little bit better at around 700 um, mean squared error for id or around 400 for iq which is still pretty high actually but but a lot better than before if we plot the residuals in a scatter plot then we can see yeah that we have errors of around minus 70 for iq up to up to roughly 100 ampere which is exactly what we have predicted or forecasted before when we did the EDA with the scatter plots where we have seen that putting a straight line into the point cloud would not give us a, a fit or a modeling where we would where we would cover all points perfectly so the error here is as expected however uh, the ultimate goal of modeling anything in a regression task would be to have a residual plot here where the residuals would exhibit a white noise shape so such that we would have only errors that are due to randomness in the, the sensor signal measurement or uh, any other form of noise here we see very strong geometrical shapes that means we still have systematic errors somehow or modeling errors which could be improved 
Now to check out whether we can improve this regression performance, we are using neural networks now. In this case, we are using the TensorFlow package, which you have to install in beforehand. And you see here a um, an example of how one could build up a multi-layer perceptron model with a lot of hyperparameters here that we could tune um, in such a way that we would come up with a model that can also be used this, the same way a scikit-learn estimator would be used. That means with a fit and predict method, maybe predict proba for probability prediction. Um, this is this is provided by uh, TensorFlow or better Keras, the high-level API of of TensorFlow, um, such that those scikit-learn APIs are exhibited. We're making use of them. But uh, because of this, it looks maybe a little bit more complicated than the usual tutorial you would watch for TensorFlow or Keras. Nonetheless, for the sake of this exercise, it might be helpful to see how to instantiate such a model or how to how to tweak or set hyperparameters in the first place for your later exercises. Um, so here's the fit method, for example. This one is, is even more enhanced in so far that we are also automatically determine a validation set, which is a difference to the linear regression training where we haven't had a, an additional validation set for training. But for neural networks, since we are iteratively going through the data set, as opposed to a linear regression, which is a, a closed form solution, which has a analytical closed form solution. We need to uh, have any indicators telling us when we should stop. And there, this 10% validation data from the training set is helping us to, to determine when generalization is actually deteriorating and when to stop training. So this, this early stopping, this for example here as a callback, we are monitoring the validation loss, which is ex actually this validation data. Uh, we are waiting for 10 epochs, for example, if the delta between the uh, last errors on the validation set are not improving for one, uh, one times 10 to, to, to the power of minus three. If that's not improving over this threshold, then we should make an early stop. Uh, same way, here a learning scheduler where we are reducing the learning rate at our stacks and for learning rate where we're reducing that uh, when it goes into a plateau while a plateau is also determined by some threshold which is not shown here if you are training your model and it takes too long or it, it exceeds your ram capabilities then you could reduce some hyperparameters for example the batch size here maybe 64 is too much you could reduce the epochs if you don't want to train for too long, or you go up to the hyperparameters here where you could reduce, for example, uh, not the standard, not the default values up here, but better here where the actual values are set. Here you could reduce, for example, number of units. Layers are already one, so no way to reduce this further. But you could reduce the end units, for example. Now, if we have a look at their training performance, which is the third task, we are just re reusing the OHEDF that was that was created in before. So for neural networks, we also need scaled data, and we also need one hoded, one hot encoded data. That's why we all reuse this data frame. We validate the same way as we've done for the linear model. You will see, if you try it out at home, you will see that the neural network takes a lot more time to train. It, but it also has a lot more total parameters, over 1000, whereas the linear model has only as many coefficients as we have features, plus one for, for the bias, for the offset. So there are a lot of a lot more parameters to tune, and on top we also have the hyperparameters, of course, which have a, an effect on training and on total parameters here. So a lot to tune, and we see then in the end 
that the um, overall MSE is a little bit better for some folds, but not much. So we're still at in the hundreds of the MSE. So the question is whether a neural network with its magnitude of parameters is really worth the hassle here because the, the estimation error is, is not way better than for the linear model. The distribution looks a little bit different because the neural network has a completely different perspective on the data because of its topology, but nonetheless, uh, Non-linear modeling is not improving the estimation error much here. That's the conclusion of the neural network training here. So if we go over to classification now, we are uh, swapping the target variables here. Now the ID, now the current at k1 is not the target anymore, but nk, the elementary vector, the time point k. And we are also including the features at time point k1, which seems like we are taking future information into account, but actually it still makes sense because with a classificator which works that way, we could use that classificator in so far that we tell them what our desired, desired currents are at k plus one, and then it would give us the nk, which would be the most likely to achieve that, that current. So it's so it, it makes sense to, to have such a setup for training. And we start off with logistic, logistic regression, um, which sounds like a regression model, but despite its name, it's actually a classification model. Um, here you have the parameters which are instantiating a logistic regression model with decent, with decent uh, capabilities. So that means training in a, a appropriate amount of time and having a uh, appropriate precision later. We do the classification here in the solution. Make sure that your Y calls and X calls now match correctly with the new targets. We are dropping all N case now from the one hot encoded data frame. We do this because NK is exactly what we try to try to predict. And if we have the one hot encoded version of it in our model, then of course that would be a severe a severe uh, case of data leakage. So that's why we drop that. And um, the training loop looks almost the same then, only that our model looks different and we have different columns for X and Y. And we are not reporting the performance in terms of the mean squared error anymore because our target is not a floating point number anymore, but rather a categorical. So this is actually a multi-class prediction task. And for that, we use the log loss, the, uh, yeah, the, the log loss error or cross entropy also, also called. So we summarize that with CE for cross entropy, and we see that there is the very same CE for each fold of 1.79. And we plot the confusion matrix here as a data frame, but you could also uh, plot it as a NumPy matrix, of course. But here for, for a nicer visualization, I did it in, in a pandas data frame. And a confusion matrix is nothing more than just a table where we have as many columns as we have classes and as many rows as we have classes to predict, whereas each column stands for the label we have predicted and each row stands for the label which was the actual true label, the so-called ground truth. So in order to interpret that, the very first cell up here means there are 44,892 cases or samples which we have labeled with one and which were actually also one. The next cell stands for 4,033 samples which we have labeled with two but were actually one. Same way this cell here or, or this one, 3,355 samples in the data set 
that we have labeled with three but were actually six. So a perfect prediction would have only non-negative entries here in the main diagonal and all zeros in the in the remaining entries. So if we repeat that now with a gradient boosting machine, which is a pretty performant model, and we instantiate them with the objective of multi-class and say we want all resources, all CPUs used, and also only 30 estimators, then we could use the very same training loop here in this case. Uh, please make, uh, please, Note here, please, that for gradient boosting, we now omit the scaling because gradient boosting machines are tree based most of the time, and tree based models are ignoring the scale of features. So, this is nothing we have to do here. We can, can omit that, and we see we come up with way better cross entropies. Uh, here now, I increase the n estimators to make the effect more apparent. Uh, but also for 30 estimators, we would see that it will be way better. So we have a cross entropy here of 0 0.66. And if you if you try this training on your machine, you will also see that the gradient boosting machine, although it has way more parameters and is way more performant, you will see that it will run much quicker and it will also utilize way more resources if you say n jobs equal minus one. So it is more efficient than logistic regression. And if we plot the confusion matrix, we also see that it has most of its um, most of its samples in the main diagonal and only few in the in the other entries. So this is in line with our better CE cross entropy error. The gradient boosting machine is uh, way more performant and more precise in this case. This concludes the eighth exercise. We had done a very brief bird eye view of using machine learning applications here on one data set. Of course, there is much more theory into each model that we have used here, which can be which can be taught and explained or learned. But for the sake of our reinforcement learning lecture, it might be it might be more helpful for you to first just to know how to utilize each model in order to um, approximate value functions, for example, or state spaces. Um, then, then knowing how each hyperparameter has its effect on training, and so on and so forth. So. I hope you like this exercise. If you have any questions, please use the Panda forum. I would like to see any questions. I would like to answer them. And yeah, have a good week.